I like to say that I'm a mama, a mystic, and a minister. Um, okay. I'm very centered on the one child that I have. And I think also very focused on the fact that I consider myself a child of God first and foremost. And then all the other things I uh, call myself have to do with what I do for work or what, what are my calling. But I center myself on the fact that I am God's child and that I'm raising a child of God. We come to church on Sunday morning and don't realize how um, often we've held our breath all throughout the week. And so to be in the beauty of this um, sanctuary and to be invited to breathe and to hum um, in community has been really powerful for people. I think people also sit down on Sunday mornings and realize they haven't stretched, they haven't you know, turned their, turned their neck from side to side. And so to be able, again, to do that in the safety and the beauty of this space in community has been very powerful for people. And I think what we don't realize and what my congregation is starting to experience is that the stories in the book that we love, many of them are traumatic. Um, there's generational trauma in the Bible, there's uh, murder, there's rape, um, and it's touching some very real trauma in people's lives. And so this embodiment, I think, also creates space for us to heal our own um, pain and trauma as well. I was raised Catholic. I went to Catholic school from second through twelfth grade. There was a time when I um, expected to become a nun. I thought I would be a nun in, in, eighth, in eighth grade. And so I think um, I tend towards practices that are contemplative. Um, I, I meditate, I do yoga, um, those sorts of things. Um, I'm an introvert, so I have uh, what psychologists would call a, a big internal world. Um, so I spend a lot of time um, in prayer and conversation with God. And so I think all of those things shape uh, where I go with the sermon. So I'm listening to what the Spirit is saying. I'm in conversation and dialogue with members of my congregation, but then also aware of what's happening in the world around us, in the newspaper, um, in, in the neighborhood, um, and all of those things come together in, in different sorts of ways uh, to take me into what the sermon is going to be on Sunday. We, we have a, a podcast every week called The Word Made Fresh, where I have a conversation with a colleague about what I'm going to preach. We do it um, 10 days before the sermon, and generally by the time I preach, um, it's not the same sermon anymore, just because so many things are churning up in the world, in the congregation, and in myself, that it, it can shift what, what happens on Sunday morning. Connecting the clergy staff, I think, has been one of the, the greatest accomplishments of my time here. Um, inviting collaboration and creativity because I think that um, connection between the clergy staff has an impact on what happens in the in the larger membership. Uh, the other thing that I'm I think very proud of is that we undertook a visioning process with um, consultants that I was familiar with through uh, a friend of mine in the theater. So to bring in folks who uh, knew how to work uh, collaboratively again and creatively with staff, clergy, and lay leaders to help the church um, shape its values, uh, to select its values, and to shape a vision for the future, um, I think is probably the greatest accomplishment we've had in the last uh, 18 months. So I am uh, what we in the vernacular call a womanist theologian, and what is at the center of womanist theology is a notion of a world where all of the people flourish. So I think my heart hopes for a world in which all God's people flourish, where they have enough food to eat, where they have work that is meaningful and dignified, housing, clothing, all of what is needed to live a glorious life. So I think the first um, gift that is necessary to invite people into a full and flourishing life is uh, the gift of vision and um, imagination. Um, there's a womanist theologian, Renita Weems, who um, talks about when there is um, the Babylonian exile in the Bible. The, um, the king takes the other king, his wives, his mother, uh, the statesmen, and the artists. And what she says about conquering a people is if you want to conquer them, you take the artists because the artists are the ones that help us to imagine a future that's different from the one that we're living. So my background is in the arts and I think one of the things that I bring to the Riverside Church is an ability to help them um, imagine a future, a now and a next future uh, that, is, that is 
forward looking um, that we cannot yet see. Uh, particularly in these days that are post-COVID, uh, the church is having to reinvent itself uh, constantly. And there's very little that has happened uh, to us and for us in the past that is preparing us for what is coming next. We have to improvise. We're creating it as we go, which is why I think this is a moment for artists. I think it's a moment for creatives. It's a moment for those who can imagine something that uh, has never been imagined before. And that is my, my life. That's my whole background is, you know, being on a stage, making up movement, um, dances and, and all of that, and helping folks to uh, live into something they haven't seen before. Well, I, I want to talk a, a bit about that humming and that movement and, and the power of it. So it is um, an embodied practice that we are engaging here at Riverside. And what it does, um, beyond grounding individual bodies and grounding the collective body, those embodied practices also help us to create space, uh, space in our bodies, but also in our spirits and our minds for what is possible. So that humming, that stretching that we do together um, helps us on an individual level, but also helps us as a community. It's building connective tissue, it's building um, glue so that we can go out in, in the world and do the things that um, I'm inviting us to do. Beyond that, I would say um, Riverside, like many churches of its size and stature, um, has done many wonderful things over decades of time uh, with the leadership of multiple clergy. Um, but also like many churches in a post-COVID world um, or in, in, in the aftermath of COVID, we are smaller than we once were, our staff is smaller. And so I think one of the other practical things is helping to knit the staff together, uh, making sure that we are supporting each other as opposed to sort of going off and leading in our own ways. We're leading collaboratively, collectively, um, and creatively. And, and that on a practical level, I think is gonna help our church to move forward um, and to be the church that the world needs in this moment. Um, so I was born in Washington, D.C. and grew up in uh, what we now call the DMV, the, the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, uh, specifically in Prince George's County. Um, both my parents are from North Carolina. They met at uh, North Carolina A&T State University, uh, moved to D.C. in the 60s. Um, I was born eight months before Dr. King was assassinated. So I find his life and legacy to be very much an influence on my life. Um, my father started a sanitation company in DC with my mom's support. They were in business for over 50 years. My mom was an army nurse, uh, and then later worked as a psychiatric nurse at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, DC, um, until she joined my father in the business. I uh, had an older brother. I have two younger sisters. Um, all of my siblings played sports. I'm the only one that uh, danced. Um, they were uh, award-winning um, athletes. And one of my sisters played um, in college as well as in high school. And I think if she had been a little um, older, if she'd come along a little later, she probably would have uh, been a great candidate for the WNBA. She was a really wonderful ball player and uh, volleyball player as well. I think the earliest and first influences would have to be my parents. Um, as I said, they were entrepreneurs, uh, very active in our community, very supportive of our family and our friends. I think like a lot of black folk, we had um, folks who were family, aunties, uncles, cousins, who weren't actually aunties, uncles, and cousins. But um, in our family, we took people in. We um, made a place and a home for uh, cousins. My parents were very involved in um, uh, setting up a scholarship fund at A&T so that students could stay in school. They knew too many people who, because of one incident in their life, weren't able to finish their studies. And so they have, um, even now, a fund that helps students not fall off their college track um, because of an incident in their family. Um, my, my father, when I was young, used to say, to whom much is given, much is expected. And he said it so much that I thought he made it up. It wasn't until I was in college that I knew that was from the Bible. Um, so these were my parents. They, they modeled and spoke in a way that let me know that my job, the expectation, uh, the responsibility I had was to be there for other people. And so I think um, I am at Riverside Church in no small part because of what they modeled in my early life. Um, beyond that, I would probably say my dance teachers were my next um, most meaningful influence. I mean, the, the discipline it takes to do 
ballet uh, and to dance with a company like the Dance Theatre of Harlem, to go on and be a Radio City Music Hall Rockette. That discipline, that determination, that ability to get up and do the thing you have to do, even on the days that you don't want to do it, um, I think gets you to a place like this. Um, but I would also say Riverside is not something I was looking for. It was not something I was striving for. Uh, a colleague said to me that they were looking. The profile seemed to fit who I was in terms of pastoral care and wanting to bring healing and holding not only to a faith community, but to the larger uh, city and nation. Um, and so in my wildest dreams, this is not where I thought I would land. Um, I think I probably go back to my daughter, um, who is a great bright light in my life. Uh, she's very smart and very funny. And she helps me, I think, not to take myself too seriously, um, which can happen, I think, when you're in a place like the Riverside Church. Um, I spend a lot of time in nature. I definitely touch the holy um, in that space. I am grateful to live in a place in New York where I'm near the water. And so I'm often out walking, running, um, stretching, and spending time um, near the water and with trees. Um, I'm generally a person, I said, who likes contemplation. I'm recently back from silent retreat. I try to go on retreat about once a quarter. Um, so every three months or so, um, to a location where silence is practice, um, either for uh, days at a time or either for many hours at a time. It's very helpful for me um, as someone who's very much in the business of words and writing uh, sermons every seven days and you know, caring for and counseling people to pull away and, and be silent uh, and to hear from God rather than to hear my own voice is very restorative for me. Um, finally, writing. Um, my undergrad degree is in writing, so I, I write as much as I can outside of what I'm required to write and, and read as much as I can as well. So it, it is my heart's desire, <laughs> my heart's hope uh, for us to do more community programming. I think of churches as community centers. They really, in my view, should be the heartbeat of the community that surrounds them. Um, and there has been such transition at Riverside. What we are working really quickly to address right now, I think is stabilizing things. Um, like many churches and institutions, we are still also recovering from the COVID lockdown. Um, there's been transition in our staff and in our community, folks leaving the city, you know, new folks coming. Um, but I believe community programming is on the way. One of the things that we added this year is a community dance class that happens once a month. It's a embodied dance prayer class. Um, but yes, we are looking to do more, to partner more, to open our doors more, and to invite the community in because I think um, what is a church if not um, an, a place for the community to gather? And I will say this, I'm not sure that anything we've ever done to make church in the past is going to be what church looks like in the future. That's what I think. Um, the majority of our congregation joins us online every Sunday. We have a you know nice size number of folks in the building on Sundays, but the majority are online um, because our elders, it is just easier, I think, for some of them to be home than struggling on public transportation, maybe on a walker to get here. For young families, it is the same thing. And then there are folks all over the country and the world who want to be at Riverside who are not physically ever going to be here. And it's an amazing thing that they're able to join online. And so just that says to me, church is not going to be what we think it's going to be in the future. And I think that's a surprise that I'm really looking forward to. And the work of the church very often is outside the walls of the church. Um, Riverside does incredible worship. We do incredible programming, even now, um, speakers and lecturers and dance classes and concerts. And it's wonderful and it's nourishing and it's beautiful. And God's people are struggling um, just outside our doors. And it's making me <laughs> about to cry. We've, we have over 100 people a day coming to our food pantry to eat. Um, there are new New Yorkers coming to our city every day. And not only Riverside, but all the churches um, across the, this country and around the world, we have to get outside the walls to help God's people. Um, there's a theologian um, who I love, Brian McLaren, who says, you know, Jesus didn't build a church. 
Jesus built a movement. And, you know, we, we build these churches and they're gorgeous and they're beautiful, but McLaren argues that they're like airports. They're places that we should pass through on the way to do the work of love and justice that Jesus calls us to do. And I say that for whoever needs to hear it. We love and um, appreciate the privilege that affords us to be at a Riverside church and to do what we do. And we've got to get outside the walls and tend to God's people.